Well, welcome everyone to one of our events in the World Cup lecture series. My name is Clyde Wilcox. I'm the interim dean this year at Georgetown University in Qatar. Um, I'm especially pleased to introduce our speaker tonight because she's one of our own alumni, a Georgetown University a Qatar alumni from 2012. And I wish I could claim some credit for uh, her success, but I came over uh, to this campus in 2014, so I can claim none of it. Asama Musa is an assistant professor of political science at Yale University, an Egyptian scholar of migration, conflict, and social cohesion. She typically partners with governments and NGOs in the Middle East and beyond to explore her questions. Her research has been published in Science and the American Political Science Review and profiled by The Economist and PBS Nova. She received her PhD in political science from Stanford in 2020. Daniel Reitz has uh, joined Georgetown University Cutter in the summer 2020 as a visiting associate professor. It's the second time he's been here at Georgetown after being a visiting assistant professor on the main campus in DC from 2006 to 2007. He is on leave from the American University of Beirut in Lebanon where he is a tenured associate professor of comparative politics. He is also the faculty lead of the Sears Research Initiative Building a Legacy, Qatar FIFA World Cup 2020, 2022, sorry. So now Daniel, let me turn it over to you. Thank you, Dean Wilcox for your kind introduction. Before I introduce today's guest speaker, I would like to inform our audience that we have an Arabic translation available. Now, it gives me great pleasure to welcome Dr. Salma Musa. Dr. Musa recently moved from California to Connecticut to become an assistant professor of political science at Yale University. She's teaching this academic year classes on immigration, integration, and multiculturalism in the West, as well as on mixed research methods. She earned her PhD in the Golden State at Stanford University with a dissertation on conflict, contact, and social cohesion. After graduating from Georgetown University, Qatar in 2012, as the Dean already mentioned, she stayed two and a half more years in Doha to work for an NGO, Silatec, and the Arab Center for Research and Policy Studies. Dr. Musa is presenting today a paper titled, Can Celebrities Reduce Prejudice? The Effect of Mohammed Salah on Islamophobic Attitudes and Behaviors that she co-authored and has been recently published as a cover article in the American Political Science Review. In her approximately 15 minutes long PowerPoint presentation, Saima will present the main results from her research that has been also widely covered by international media such as The Economist or The Independent. Afterwards, I will ask Saima a couple of questions before I open the discussion to all participants. Please use for tweets related to this event our hashtag CIRS2022, CIRS2022, and check out our website for the previous four lectures, as well as our blog with so far 22 short articles and our podcast series with so far 16 conversations with experts on the 20 experts on the 2022 World Cup. You can subscribe to our podcast, Qatar FIFA World Cup 2022, on all common podcast platforms. Saima, before you start your lecture, I have one personal question. When Qatar was awarded to host the World Cup in December 2010, you were a student here at GUQ. How do you remember this historic moment for the country? Yeah, that thank you for well firstly thank you for the very kind introduction and I'm so uh, I'm so happy to be um, presenting as as an alumni and to reconnect with Georgetown. Um, so to answer your question, it was obviously a very, very happy day for all of us. Um, my first instinct, though, I have to be honest was you know, a mixed one, because on the one hand, I thought, I really wish that the first World Cup in the Middle East would be in Egypt. Uh -huh. um, but then recognizing that obviously, you know, for various reasons, Egypt, you know, um, you know, didn't have a, a bid that year, a competitive bid, 
then, you know, and it went to Qatar, I was still happy that that our region and our culture was going to be represented for the first time. Um, I had a lot of friends involved in that campaign, and it was just nice to get um, to get some recognition that we are a part of the world that really cares about football. Mm -hmm. All right. Since you will be talking about Mo Salah, one of the best Muslim football players in the world, I would like to mention that uh, at the weekend, his team, Liverpool Football Club, won 5-0 in Watford. And of course, he scored a goal. All right. But this is just a small anecdote. Please, Simon, we look forward very much to your lecture. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you. And it was not just any goal, I should say. If you have not seen the highlights from that game, I encourage you to watch it. Um, okay, I will just share my screen. All good? Okay, great. Great. Thanks, everyone, for having me. I'm really excited to present some results from a, a recent paper. Uh, this is joint work with Ale El Rababa, Will Marble, and Alexandra Siegel uh, on the effect of exposure to Muhammad Salah on Islamophobia. So this slide hopefully shouldn't take me very long, which is who is Salah? So in case you're not familiar with him, he's uh, an Egyptian uh, soccer player who plays at the highest levels of world football. Um, I guess I should just stick to one thing. I'll just say soccer for now, because that's what the slides say. Uh, he's been the top scorer in the Premier League twice. He's been voted best player in the Premier League. He won the Champions League final with Liverpool, and he won Liverpool's first uh, Premier League trophy in 2020. And he also led Egypt to the 2018 World Cup. He was a very important part of that campaign. So we're talking about, you know, currently people are calling him the best in the world. He's definitely in the conversation for one of the best players playing right now. So this is a really high profile um, Egyptian player playing at the highest levels of um, elite uh, soccer in Europe. So why do we focus on him for this study? What is special about him other than his skill? Um, so we got thinking about the possible social effects of uh, Salah when we heard, uh, when we saw a video of Liverpool uh, fans chanting this chant, if he scores another few, then I'll be Muslim too. If he's good enough for you, he's good enough for me sitting in a mosque, that's where I want to be. And, you know, no offense to Liverpool fans or soccer fans in general, but, um, you know, there's there are some uh, some perceptions that that fan base is not necessarily the most tolerant. Uh, historically, there have been problems with hooliganism and racism in, in soccer, uh, which have been improving, but are definitely still there. So when you hear fans chanting this, saying, I want to be Muslim, I want to be sitting in a mosque, like this is unusual to say the least. And so this got us thinking, can we actually quantify the effects of Salah on Islamophobia? And we weren't the only people um, thinking this. So here are some, some uh, headlines from the New York Times, from the New Yorker, from some other newspapers, where there, it was really widely speculated in the press that uh, Salah was actually breaking down people's Islamophobia because he was such a fantastic player. And the key part of it is he's not just a great player, but he's very publicly, visibly Muslim. So he's not the first Muslim player to play at that level. I mean, Zinedine Zidane, for example, one classic example of a player Muslim player, one of the best ever, um, but we wouldn't necessarily expect these effects because he's not so visible in his uh, practicing of his religion. And so people don't really associate um, certain players with Islam as much as they do with Salah. So this is really the first time fans are seeing a player uh, prostrate and pray on the field after scoring goals uh, to kind of point at the sky and say the Shahada, who has a wife who's wearing a headscarf. His daughter's name is Mecca. So, you know, the link is very strong between Islam and this player. And by the way, this headline in the middle, the Liverpool FC's Muhammad Salah, so, uh, sports star subtly confronting racism and Islamophobia. This was written by Yasmina Sayyad, who is also a Georgetown alumni for The New Yorker. So with that, our research question is, can exposure to celebrities reduce prejudice? And more specifically, has exposure to Muhammad Salah reduce Islamophobic behaviors and attitudes. So a bit of the theory behind this. So why, when would you expect contact between people to reduce prejudice? So there's a classic uh, psychological theory about this um, by Gordon Allport. And the idea is that contact across group lines under certain conditions. And so these conditions are when the contact places people on equal footing, so there's not a hierarchy, when it's endorsed by communal authorities and endorsed by social norms, 
And most importantly, when the contact involves cooperating for a common goal, that this kind of contact is well suited to build friendships and reduce prejudice. But that obviously talks about a context where people are in the same room together, in a classroom, maybe playing soccer together on the field. But in real life, we, those kinds of scenarios are, are pretty rare. Meaningful contact is usually very limited because groups are segregated in terms of where they live and the kinds of workplaces they go to. Um, Intergroup anxiety or prejudice might stop people, even if they are coming into contact from actually having a conversation. And some minority groups are very small in size. And so it's just not physically possible to actually, to actually put together this kind of contact in a natural way. So given that this kind of perfect, you know, ideal contact is very hard to find in real life, the role of the media or mediated contact, so you're kind of having contact with a celebrity through the media, so through some medium like television. Um, so there's been good research about this that shows that people actually form relationships with celebrities uh, and, and fictional characters. You feel like you know them um, and you actually have some personal connection with them. So for us, the question was, you know, can that kind of uh, can that kind of exposure, so not contact, but just one-sided exposure, have the same effects as traditional face-to-face -face contact? And so to test this idea, we look at, uh, we look at three main data sources for our, our three main analyses. The first is an analysis of hate crimes in the UK. The second is an analysis of anti-Muslim tweets by soccer fans uh, who are based in the UK. And the third is an original survey experiment of Liverpool fans also in the UK. So I'll start with the hate crimes analysis. So I just want to give you a bit of the intuition behind, you know, how you can actually test this question. So we know the hate crime rates in Merseyside, which is the county that Liverpool is in. We know the hate crime rate in Merseyside before and after Salah joins. But we can't just look at what happens to the hate crime rates when he joins. And if it goes down, we say, oh, it's because of Salah. You, you can't say that, right? It could be a million other things. So what we need is what we need to do is we need to predict what would have happened in Merseyside if Salah had not joined. So what would, you know, in another universe where Salah never joined, would the hate crime rate have stayed the same, gone up, gone down? And then we compare it to what actually happened. So obviously we don't have another universe to play with where we can have Salah not join Liverpool. So our best comparison to, to fill in for this prediction um, is to look at uh, other counties that had very, very similar hate crime trends before Salah joined. So we use something called a synthetic control method. And what we do is we then compare what happened in those places that looked very similar to Merseyside before he joined. And then we compare their hate crime trends after he joined with what happened in Merseyside. And so I'll jump straight into the main results. Um, so we got data from, uh, we, we sent freedom of information requests to all the police uh, departments in, uh, in England. And what the usable data that we got was about 1000 county month observations. And what you see here is that for the couple of years before Salah joined, those, the solid black line is Merseyside where Liverpool is. And the, shade, the uh, dash blue line is all the other counties that look very similar to Merseyside. We put them together into one. So you can see before Salah joined in the white part of the graph, those lines track very, very closely. So the hate crime rate was very, very similar. Then in the gray shaded part after he joins uh, in June of 2017, we see that the black line, so Merseyside, we see this drop that kind of continues dropping compared to the blue line, which is what we would have expected based on the trends in similar places. And this amounts to about a 16% drop in the actual hate crime rate relative to what we would have predicted. And then we do, uh, we kind of reuse the same research design on anti-Muslim tweets as well. So we scrape the Twitter timelines of 10,000 followers of the top five clubs in the UK and Everton, which is the other club in uh, the city of Liverpool. These are all old followers. These are people who have been following their clubs, you know, way before Salah joined Liverpool. Overall, we scraped 15 million tweets. We then identified the tweets that specifically mention Muslims or Islam, which is 44,000. And then we code them as being anti-Muslim or not. So we actually have some humans who are coding a sample of these tweets. And then based on how the humans code the sample, we use like an automated um, like machine learning method for classifying the rest of the tweets. 
Um, and then we do this like prediction to figure out, you know, what what would have what would have the rate what what would the rate be of Liverpool fans tweeting anti-Muslim tweets relative to what we actually observe among fans of very similar clubs? And so this is a really similar graph to the one we showed you earlier. So we see that um, in the years before Salah joined, about a three-year period, um, that more or less Liverpool fans and fans of the other top five clubs are tweeting anti-Muslim tweets at very similar rates. And then after he joins, we see again that black solid line, which is Liverpool fans. We see a drop in anti-Muslim tweets, um, while the trend for the other fans of top five clubs is actually rising. And so this amounts to about a, a halving, so 50% drop in uh, anti-Muslim tweets among Liverpool fans relative to fans of the other top five clubs. So we have this evidence now that right about the time that Salah joined, we have a drop in hate crimes and a drop in anti-Muslim tweets relative to these other very close comparison groups. So what is driving this effect? So if Salah really did reduce these uh, pretty extreme behaviors, uh, how did he do it? So we wanted to explore the mechanisms behind this. So we ran a, a survey through Facebook and this was the ad that we used. And we targeted this ad to fans of Liverpool. So people who like the Liverpool page um, and who live in the UK. In the end, we had over 8,000 completed survey responses. And just so you get a sense of who the median respondent was, the median respondent was 54 high school educated at most uh, and white. And then we randomly assigned them to two conditions. One is a pure control where they just see a little text saying, as you might know, Mo Salah is an Egyptian footballer who joined Liverpool in June um, of, 20, uh, of 2016 or 17. Um, and that's it. And he's a winger and that's all we say. And then we ask some questions about social attitudes in the UK. So that's the control condition where we don't really prime them to think about anything. And the other half of respondents are assigned to the religiosity treatment. So we give them the basic facts about Salah and then on top of it, we really stress that he's a religious Muslim. So what does that actually look like? So this was the religiosity treatment. We say, um, in addition to his goal scoring, he's known for his attachment to his Muslim identity, both on and off the pitch. After every goal he scores, he touches his head to the ground in prayer. He fasts during Ramadan, expects on match days, and he shares well wishes during the Islamic holidays. Um, I think the text is cut off here, but we also say his wife is, uh, wears a headscarf and his daughter's name is Mecca after the holiest uh, site in Islam. So we're really reminding people that he is, he is Muslim. And what we find is that uh, when we compare the two groups, those who are reminded that he's Muslim and those who are not reminded, we see this positive effect. So what you're seeing here, this dot is basically the difference in the average outcome between the two groups. So um, let's start from the bottom up. So when we ask people about, you know, how do you feel about immigration in the UK? Do you think immigrants have a positive or negative impact? You see that line there, the confidence interval, it crosses zero. So we actually can't tell any difference between those two groups. So it doesn't seem like reminding people about his relig religiosity has an impact on how people view immigrants. Moving up, how much do you feel you have in common with Muslims in general? We see a slight positive effect, so it's on that positive side of zero, but again, it crosses the zero, so it's the confidence interval crosses zero, so we can't really say that this is a true effect. It could be due to random chance. Then when we look at our third key outcome, which is, is Islam compatible with British values? We see this positive significant effect, so about a five percentage point increase for the people who are reminded of his religiosity versus those who don't get that prime. Um, and this PC outcome, that's uh, an index where we combine all of these three things together, but it's really driven by this outcome of thinking that Islam is compatible with British values. So it really seems like when you, th that the, the mechanism of all of this is that Salah is really psychologically linked to Muslims in general and Islam in general. And so that's how he's having this uh, broader mm -hmm. effect on prejudice. So to wrap up, we find evidence for um, a pretty significant reduction in hate crimes and hate speech after Salah joins Liverpool relative to what we would have expected based on trends uh, in similar areas and among similar fans. Is this because fans are just happier because Liverpool is doing well? 
Well, we actually find no effect on any other crime type. So we look at like 20 or 30 different other types of crime and we see no drop except on hate crimes. Um, actually, the only other change we saw was in drug related crimes and that was actually an increase in Liverpool. <laughs> Uh, so it seems like, you know, there was a genuine reduction in prejudice toward Muslims, but this can actually um, happen in two ways. One could be that Salah actually reduced prejudice among the people who commit hate crimes and hate speech. Or maybe he didn't actually change how those people feel internally toward Muslims, but he changed the social norm where it was no longer acceptable to commit those kinds of acts. And we can't, we can't differentiate those two things. Um, and from our survey experiment, we find that, you know, the group identity, so your minority identity should be very salient and very obvious for this kind of positive uh, relationship with one person to generalize toward the entire group that they're from. But this is uh, still still leaves us with an important question, which is under what conditions can we expect a similar effect to other athletes? And more specifically, what happens when he stops scoring? Um, this was, we ran the study at a time when Liverpool was doing amazingly, amazingly well. Uh, and so it's really unclear what's, what happens when the nature of the exposure changes and it becomes negative if he stops performing or if he leaves the club, for example. Uh, and that's actually what our current study is about. Some possible implications for Qatar 2022. So exposure to successful players potentially has the potential to reduce prejudice. Um, so in the World Cup, it's very obvious what group people are from, at least their national identity is very obvious compared to in domestic leagues where people aren't really sure where certain players are from. So that's one condition that we have as a check, you know, people, it's obvious what your identity is. Um, you have a potential for positive exposure to Arabs and Muslims relative to other like negative media coverage that people are uh, used to. But on the other hand, there could be a backlash if Qatari players underperform, if they perform badly, or what if they beat your country that you're rooting for? So it's not that cooperative contact. It starts becoming a negative thing where you're competing against Qataris um, or they're kicking you out of the group stage or whatever, um, So or the knockout rounds rather. So it really depends on the nature of the exposure. Uh, and is the World Cup long enough to really, is the exposure sustained enough? Are people really building relationships uh, with these players enough that, that we would see these effects. And then lastly, you know, I said that the national identity is obvious in the World Cup, but are Qatari players considered Qatari? So we know that in, uh, nearly everyone on the squad has been, has grown up through the, um, through the Qatari soccer system. Um, but there's this idea that, oh, they're not actually from Qatar, they're naturalized. And so what might happen is that the fans watching the World Cup, they see these players and they like them, but then they say, oh, but that's an exception. They're not like real Qataris. And so it's not gonna generalize to the entire population. So that's another possibility. So there's a lot going on here. I know Daniel has a lot of questions too. So I'll, I'll pause there and I'm looking forward to everyone's questions. Before I read the questions from the attendees, I have a couple of questions for Saima. And my first question, Saima, is, uh, do you think that your results, less hate crimes and Islamophobic tweets will last beyond the period of your data, data collection and be of permanent duration? I mean, that's the million dollar question. You know, how long do these effects last? Um, most studies that we have, I mean, we, we're collecting data for like a year or two after he joined. Um, most studies of prejudice look at, you know, just a couple of days after the program ends. So this is something where the field really needs to do a bit better in collecting long-term outcomes. I would say that the biggest um, negative shock potentially will be if he, you know, stops scoring or if he moves to another club. I think if you have this kind of negative shock to the relationship between Salah and fans, that's probably the, for me, like one, one reasonable, place where you would expect this effect to start disappearing well hopefully he's not transferring to newcastle <laughs> that would be the worst of all i mean it depends where he goes too i mean like when benitez moved to everton like that's that's not good <laughs> so if he goes to another country entirely at the end of his career it might be okay uh Simon, what does the contact hypothesis mean for Qatar if uh, with if COVID allows hundreds of thousands of fans from around the world traveling to the World Cup next year, many of them being exposed for the first time to the region. 
so the question is like, what is the quantity and what is the quality of that contact? Um, so the quantity, is it sustained enough? Is one month or just coming for a couple of days? Is that enough to change someone's attitudes? And then the quality of the contact. So what does the contact between fans and Qataris look like? Is it just, you know, someone checking your ticket and, you know, at a restaurant or, you know, giving you a bill or, you know, what is the, or is it a meaningful conversation? Are you actually getting to know locals and having a conversation, right? So is it meaningful? Um, is it positive? So is, con is contact going to be positive? It's really hard to predict that. Um, there's some part that we can never control, like maybe some people come and, and arrive and they just want to watch the game. They're not that open minded. They're not that interested in getting to know people. Um, some interactions can go badly just because, you know, people are very heated at football games. Um, but at the same time, like if if we do have these meaningful interactions and I don't know, like maybe in the fan zones, like fan zones could be a space where people start having those friendly conversations, then I think that has a real potential. Um, so if you have that long lasting meaningful contact with locals then the question becomes are those locals going to be seen as representative of Qataris and that is something where like just from a from a research perspective we really don't know like when do people say oh this person is an exception they're not like the rest of them this guy is cool you know or when do they say oh yeah you know what like actually I have a Qatari friend and you know Qataris are not all that bad for example um, yeah, so yeah. that's something we don't know as much <laughs> The Supreme Committee recently um, re launched a host, a host of fan initiatives. So the idea is that uh, you know fans can stay with with Qatari families. Uh, I mean, it remains to see how many people are willing to host fans. But in, in theory, I think it's a great idea. And following up on on that question and discussion, so we discussed now the Salah effect. Uh, could there be something like uh, a Qatar effect? Uh, that we have after the World Cup um, less prejudices on Islam and on the Arab world and also a more positive view on, on, on Qatar uh, in other parts of the world. And I mean, I'm aware that the answering of the question is speculation at this point, but um, as a researcher, what would you say, how could a research agenda look like to investigate whether there's something like a Qatar effect after the World Cup. So first I should say that any program that brings Qatari locals or nationals in contact with fans in a positive way for a long period of time, like the research will tell you that that is, that has a very good chance of reducing prejudice and, you know, that those tend to be very positive things. The one little wrinkle is the kinds of people, you know, fans who sign up for those programs are not necessarily representative fans. Like they might be people who are already very tolerant and very open to other cultures. And so it's hard to know, you know, what is the effect of this program as opposed to just the selection of those kinds of people. But on the whole, I would be, you know, very supportive of those programs. Um, so on, you know, is there a Qatar effect similar to the Salah effect? So I think, again, the question is, what does the exposure look like? So fans just watching the World Cup, are they getting a positive impression or are they getting a negative impression? Um, so on the on the positive side, uh, we know that, you know, you're going to see mascots and hopefully the fan experience is smooth and people can see that um, they can you know really see some positive parts of the culture through the branding. Um, and so there's a lot of potential there that this is the first time people are actually seeing those images that are not, you know, war torn images or something from the Middle East. And so that can really be a positive thing when people's baseline level of exposure is almost zero or is very negative. Right. Um, on the other hand, like people's exposure to Qatar 2022 until now. Um, a large part of that, or at least for some people, some part of that has been negative. Like we have the reports of uh, human rights abuses and reports of um, uh, corruption and bribery. And so these kinds of stories. And then there's also an association with other like golf owned clubs. So we have obviously Qatar owns PSG, but you also have now Saudi Arabia uh, uh, bought, buying Newcastle. There's been a lot of negative coverage about that from a human rights perspective. So there's like, it's really a mixed bag in terms of people's impression right now. And so it's just gonna, you know, time will tell. Um, whether the actual World Cup can balance that out or whether they can address those issues sufficiently so that people do start to have more of a, a net positive exposure. 
An interesting aspect of your paper um, is that you mentioned that Mo Salah avoids politics. So I think in my classes, um, we discussed so often the case of Colin Kaepernick, uh, but there are also other um, um, athlete activists such as Megan Rapinoe, for example. So how does uh, Salah compare to them? And, and, and do you think the positive view on Salah would change if he would, for example, make public statements expressing solidarity with Palestine? Um, so this is something we've thought about a lot as well, which is, um, you know, what is special about Salah relative to other players? How would we expect these results to generalize to other players? And one thing about him that's very distinctive is that he tends to really avoid taking any kind of political stance. Um, he doesn't comment on politics uh, almost ever. And we think that that's probably an important part of the story. Um, if you start taking political stances, by definition, you will most likely be polarizing the fan base, right? Some people will agree with you, some people will disagree with you. And of course, when you alienate some people, your average effect on prejudice, you know, might not be as effective because you just alienate some fans. And unfortunately, this has been the case with Colin Kaepernick is he took a political stance, which was divisive. Um, and it not only hurt his career, but, you know, maybe it also reduced his, you know, reach from a social perspective to get people to listen to that message. But we just don't know, right? So like this, there are two goals that athletes can have. There's activism, like you want to draw attention to a cause and you want to change policy. And then there's, you know, my goal is to just be myself, focus on my job, and then people will like me through that. And that's really been Salah's way. Um, and it could be that being an activist might also reduce prejudice because people start to empathize with what minority players are going through and they start to, you know, see that perspective. And we have research about perspective taking and empathy about how that's some, you know, that that's something that can reduce prejudice. So, you know, we can't really say which one is more effective, but um, we do think that it helps. Um, it might potentially help in terms of prejudice reduction to just stay quiet um, but it's not really helping your activism goal potentially. So that's kind of a personal choice that uh, celebrities make. And, you know, Salah did make a statement on Palestine and that was polarizing. Some people thought it went too far. Some people thought he didn't go far enough. Um, and actually when we did our research, you know, we found one of the few times that there was a negative re reaction to Salah was, I think he was playing for Basel back then and he was playing an Israeli club and he didn't shake hands with the players. And until now, if you, you know, if you look online, uh, you know, people's comments about Salah, generally the only really, really negative response was from Israeli fans around that incident. So it just shows you even a very minor politicized incident can really divide, um, divide fans and, and spur this backlash. That's interesting. Uh, maybe Liverpool never played an Israeli team in the Champions League. I don't know. Yeah, I think so that's true. Um, my, my last question before moving to the general discussion is um, you have uh, recently um, published in Science Magazine another soccer related article titled Building Social Cohesion Between Christians and Muslims Through Soccer in Post ISIS Iraq. Could you share with us some insights what motivated you to write this paper and what were the main results? Sure. So uh, as I showed you with this paper about Salah, that was really looking at the fan experience. So just one sided exposure to a player. And uh, this paper that you mentioned in science was looking at what is the effect of traditional inter intergroup contact. So not watching as a fan, but actually playing on a team, an amateur team. Um, with someone from a different group than you. And so in this case, uh, it was a set of soccer leagues that we set up in Northern Iraq uh, after ISIS left. And these were communities that were all displaced by ISIS and you had Christian and Muslim communities and the, the trust was very low between them, even though they were all victims of ISIS. Uh, so the question is, can playing on the same team build trust and build tolerance? And what I found was that it did achieve that goal among the teammates and among the other people you meet in the league. But those positive effects did not actually extend to 
how you felt about the out group in general. So people were not more likely to go to different neighborhoods. They weren't more likely to go to mixed social events where there are people they don't know from the other group. They weren't more likely to donate money to an NGO that serves you know, people from both groups. So those effects were really concentrated on, on the friends that the friendships that were made. Um, so for me, you know, the takeaway was like in these really difficult post-conflict settings, you, you can't rely only on things like intergroup contact and sports to build trust in an environment where um, it's not actually rational to trust strangers. Um, so what it can do is build some friendships between people who, who, come, who come together. And that's a really powerful thing. I think it's the world is better off for it. But is it actually going to change the underlying causes of conflict? Like probably not. You need to combine those grassroots programs um, with the structural programs that actually address the reasons for distrust in the first place. Yeah, very good. This reminds me on my research on, on Lebanese football. Um, starting with the questions, uh, Farah Al Alem is asking, uh, and of course this refers to the Salah paper, how long did completing the research take? Uh, so I think all in all, it probably took about a year to, from, from when we first started sending up the request to the police departments, uh, to when we started scraping the, the Twitter data, that probably took the longest time is waiting for the police departments to respond to our freedom of information requests. Um, but yeah, I think from the start of data collections, when we had a first draft of the paper, it was maybe about a year, a year and a half. Okay, that's quite efficient. Another question is, um, based on your research, do you think that the same trends could be observed in other fields than sports? So I think that's, I assume that's a general question on the contact hypothesis. Yeah, I mean, uh, one of the examples that we talk about in the paper is a show called The Great British Bake Off where one of the winners a few years ago, so this is one of the most popular shows on British TV. It's a, it's a baking competition. One of the winners a few years ago was a Bangladeshi origin uh, Muslim woman, Nadia Hussain, who wears a headscarf. And, you know, there were, I was reading some analyses of her win saying that her winning that show did more for relations between British, uh, uh, native British people and Muslim immigrant Brits than you know, 20 years of government policy. So having that kind of positive figure, so it's really a role model figure, very similar to Salah, it's not just any celebrity. It's a very, very like non-controversial, you know, very wholesome, very successful, talented person. Um, and you're seeing them in an, you know, you have something in common with them. They're a baker, you're into baking, and it's completely non-political. Um, and you're seeing this human side of them every week, kind of in a similar way to Salah. Um, so we think that this effect can really generalize to all sorts of celebrities, like not just through sports. I'm not surprised about your example since I read in your CV that you like baking. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, next question is from Ronnie Blaschke, who is a German journalist. Uh, what is your perception of the Western coverage of the World Cup in Qatar? Do you see stereotypes about the Arab and Muslim world? Hmm. I think the coverage has mainly focused on these different reports that I mentioned. So the human rights abuses is one and the other being the corruption and bribery scandals that have hit FIFA over the past few years. Um, so I won't say that those that the coverage is just confirming negative stereotypes, but um, the media is not really incentivized to go out of their way to show more nuanced parts of a story. Um, for example, from the angle of the Qatari people, like, so how, what is the effect on um, Qatari nationals? We know the effects on migrant workers, and that's really important to know that. Um, but I, I'd say that there hasn't been much of an effort to show um, other possible kind of social initiatives that are happening. And if there are responses to these reports of corruption and are responses to the reports of human rights abuses, I don't see as much coverage of that. And so that's just my own ignorance. I'm not really sure like what, um, what steps have been taken to address those. Um, so I'd say not, no, I'd say kind of confirming negative stereotypes, but, but mainly that those, the reporters are not going out of their way to provide other kinds of um, stories from other segments of Qatari society. 
Yeah, and uh, of course, we also need a bit to differentiate between media from different countries. I mean, the uh, British press is certainly most critical with with uh, the World Cup in Qatar. Uh, and actually, the next uh, question by Thomas Fletcher is also referencing Britain. So he's asking, are there spikes in Islamophobic behaviors that can be attributed to on-field performances? And he's referring to the case of the Euros when, when black English player were harassed um, um, on social media. Right. Um, so this is, uh, so I think this is actually part of the, our follow-up study now. Our follow-up study now directly asked this question, what is the minority penalty uh, to underperforming or having a bad performance? Um, and this is, a, we were really motivated by the example of the Euros finals when you had three young black players on the English team who missed penalties. Um, and we saw at least anecdotally, so I don't know, you know how systematic this was, I haven't seen the data yet, but you did hear these reports of um, like racist abuse against those players. And so the question is, if we want Salah effects to change the world, are we putting a really big burden on those minority players to basically be perfect and uh, not really give them a right to have a bad day? Um, and if so, then it, this is not really a sustainable approach to changing people's attitudes. Um, so hopefully we can answer this question, you know, this time next year. Uh, I hope to have a paper for you on that. Uh, Paulinho Robles um, from Qatar University, who also made a great contribution to our blog, is asking whether um, Salah's outward Islamic features make him an ambassador of Islam. Yes, absolutely. So, I mean, in from a theoretic perspective, you need these contact partners or, you know, the celebrity to be perceived as typical. You need them to be seen as typical so that these results or some positive feeling toward one person can actually generalize to the entire group. So if someone is not seen as typical, then the results are not going to generalize, right? Um, and so the fact that his, you know, his name is Muhammad, he has a beard, he, you know, all this, all these other features that we talked about that he prays after he scores, you cannot build a fence around him and say, oh, he's an exception. Like you have to accept that he is actually quite typical and he's a practicing Muslim. Um, and so we think that that's like pretty key and that differentiates him from players like Paul Pogba, for example, or even Sadio Mane, who are not seen as being at, who are not as connected to Islam in people's minds, in part because um, black people are not really as, they're not seen as typical Muslims, which is obviously not true. There's no such thing. Um, but being Arab as well also makes that connection easier in people's minds. So you have to be typical, but without confirming negative stereotypes, which is a very difficult spot to be in. But we think that Muhammad, Muhammad Salah is in that spot. Yeah, my colleague Mahfoud Amara from Qatar University makes a comment and asks a question. He says, uh, Salah is not the first and last player of Muslim culture and background to join the Premier League. And not all players may be comfortable to be identified in relation to their religion and want to be perceived as football player. True. His question is, are there any other variables at play which explain the decli decline of hate, hate crimes? And what was the vote uh, uh, in Liverpool uh, Merseyside for the Brexit. If I remember, Liverpool actually rejected Brexit in the end. Um, Liverpool has a very interesting history in general. It, it's so Merseyside, I think, is in the top five counties in terms of hate crimes. Um, but they have this weird uh, history. There's actually a great paper by my colleague Florian Foos and his uh, co-authors showing that you know Liverpool bo boycotted the Sun newspaper. Um, back for, you know, they, they had this stadium tragedy where um, 96 Liverpool fans died in a, sta in a stadium uh, stampede accident. Um, and the Sun newspaper kind of blamed the fans for this. And so the whole city essentially has not read this newspaper. And this newspaper has been, it's like a right wing tabloid that really pushed for Brexit. And so they actually made this connection that this boycotting of this newspaper made people in Liverpool a bit more um, cosmopolitan in a way than fans of other cities. So it, it's kind of an interesting place in, in that um, perspective, from that perspective. Uh, so the hate crime result. So, I mean, what we can say is around about the time that he joined, we see this drop 
relative to the trend in other very similar places. So the question is, you know, was there anything else that happened around that time that could explain this effect? Like we don't see any other um, like plausible explanation for that. Um, and I guess the other piece of evidence we have is that we do this analysis for all the crime types, not just hate crimes, and we don't see this drop in any other uh, any other crime type. Um, so, you know, but that's just one analysis. And so that's why it was important for us to have the Twitter analysis and the survey experiment to try to get totally different sources of data and see if we can find similar, um, similar effects. Hmm. Murat Labdi is asking, do you think Salah would have the same effect if he was born in the UK to immigrant parents? Um, yeah, that's a, that's a, that's an interesting one. So we saw that um, in our survey experiment that expo or reminding people about Salah's religiosity didn't have an effect on how people felt about immigrants. And we think it's because people don't really see Salah as an immigrant. They see him more as a Muslim, you know, an Egyptian, he's an Egyptian national player. So he's not really, um, he's not like seen as a, you know, a, a British Muslim, which might be a completely different um, set of results if that was the case. Um, so I think in that case, you would expect that the outgroup that the results would generalize to, it wouldn't be necessarily Muslims or Islam, it would be British Muslims in particular. And in our, in our survey experiment, we also don't find an effect on how people feel toward British Muslims, because Salah is not a British Muslim. Um, and so I think there are these, you know, other celebrities, uh, I mean, thinking about in the US, you have um, Yanis, he's a, they call him the Greek freak, he's a basketball player. Who, uh, who's born to refugee parents. And so that's another example, like does your like immigrant status actually make people now more empathetic toward refugees or change their attitudes toward immigrants? So that's like, a, I think a study that's waiting to be written on these um, immigrant, um, immigrant descent players in particular. Herman uh, Kornukman is asking um, how sport and physical activity can help Muslim youth uh, in terms of radicalization and integration to the society? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it has a lot of potential. I think it has a lot of potential, one, because obviously being physically active and having some commitment, you know, some extracurricular commitments that you, that you do, like you have to show up and be organized and disciplined. And um, it's like, it adds this, you know, we, we know all these positive social and psychological effects of sports. Um, at the same time, it opens you up to a new social network. And this is, you know, I'm just guessing here, this is speculation, but I think the real power of sports in terms of radicalization is actually the social connections. It's connecting those vulnerable youth to people from other groups, could be religious minorities or people who have, you know, different ideological views, less extreme. Um, and that kind of exposure um, hopefully is something that can balance out the very narrow social networks that people who are um, in the process of being radicalized tend to find themselves in. Gary Sinclair is asking, um, he's writing on the, on the fan songs that you referenced at the beginning of your presentation. It is contextualized positively, but that does it not indicate quite a discriminatory attitude towards Muslims in that Salah is so good, I might even consider being a Muslim as if that is something completely absurd. And he thinks of other examples of clubs, Manchester United with Parky Sun, for example, where racist tropes are used in a way that is supposed to be endearing, but it's actually very offensive. Yeah, so um, I mean, I think what the question is referring to is there's a, a chant that's about a Korean player and the chant talks about, you know, Koreans eating dogs, which is like obviously a very negative like trope to be the center of a chant. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think these fan chants are, you know, one data point, but for us it points to, okay, maybe the baseline, you know, how people are feeling toward Muslims is still on the whole negative, but is it improving? Is it an improvement compared to what we would expect without this player? Um, and I would say the same for, um, actually there's a few clubs now where you have really high profile Asian players. So you have Spurs obviously with Son. Um, I think it's Watford now who has a Korean player as well, or is it Watford? or no Wolves, I think Wolves. 
Um, so can we see like this similar effect, even if fans are actually starting from a very racist place, do we still see an improvement relative to what we would expect? And so that's, I think, you know, another study that's waiting to be written is on these Asian players, especially uh, with the backlash and the prejudice toward Asians um, after COVID-19. Um, so were those clubs that had Asian players a bit more immune or resilient to that anti-Asian racism spike that happened after COVID? So I think that's a really important question to be answered. Yeah, uh, Koen Kians is asking, um, Salah has flourished with the accepted structures of English, has flourished within the accepted structures of English football. Okay, I get it. The Qatar World Cup uh, diverges from many football fans' expectations of a World Cup climate unsuitable to football. Well, I think it's great in November and December. That's my comment. Lack of internationally known football heritage. Um, okay, and so on. So is there a chance that fans view Qatar 2022 as distorting rather than enriching the game they love? Yeah, and I mean, I think this is this is part of the, you know, is it what is the exposure to Qatar 2022 for the average fan from Europe or from South America or from Africa who doesn't have that much exposure to the Middle East and the Arab world? Is it positive or is it negative? And there's a lot of things that feed into the possible negative exposure, and that's one of them. So the fact that this is a really unusual World Cup in a lot of ways, um, if that could be seen as being negative, then you're not going to potentially get this positive, you know, boost to attitudes toward Muslims or toward Arabs or people from the Gulf, if this is actually seen as a, a World Cup that is um, different in a bad way than what people are used to. And that probably feeds into the narrative of like, oh, this was not a fair process, you know, because this is so different than what we're used to. So that's another possible reason that you might get this um, negative exposure on the whole. But, you know, we don't know what the positive exposure potentially is going to look like yet to see the net effect. Mm -hmm. um, then there is a question by Emmanuel Nana. Are there any further applications to this research in terms of race and religion or any other areas? I mean, there's no, there's no reason to think that the contact theory only needs to apply to Muslims. So this theory originally came about in the 1950s in response to the desegregation of US schools. So, you know, mixing black and white students for the first time. And so the idea was that this mixing, you start to have that one on one contact that will start in the classroom that will reduce prejudice toward black people. Um, so that's how it started, but now it's been applied to all sorts of outgroups and all sorts of stigmatized minorities, um, disabled people, the elderly, ethnic minorities, religious minorities. Um, so there's, there's no theoretic reason to think that this, we wouldn't expect very similar trends for other outgroups as well. Mm -hmm. Thomas Fletcher is asking another question. Is it realistic to rely on on-field performances of minorities, whether racial, ethnic, et cetera, to solve off-field problems like racism, homophobia, et cetera? I mean, I don't think anyone's relying on it. It's, I don't think anyone's saying that that has to be the only, you know, policy tool. Um, it's not even a policy tool. It's not really something that governments can control that much, but it is one factor in part of people's ecosystem of factors that affects how they treat minorities, which I think can be powerful. Um, but I think what you touch on is really the motivation for our current study that we're working on, which is do these players also have to act basically perfectly and have no bad days in order to get these Salah effects, in which case it's especially, you know, unsustainable to um, rely too heavily on players as being a source of prejudice reduction. Yeah, there is, I'm not sure whether I get the question, Fati Abu El Khadai, um, uh, who is referring to um, his action before the match with Basel against uh, Maccabi Tel Aviv mm. um, and asking what was the difference in your opinion between the two actions. So I, I, I assume the question is, isn't that like a political action that he, he took? I mean, of the two, I think in his whole public career, Salah has basically made two political moves, both of them, you know, quite minor, um, but they got some attention. So the first is not shaking the hands of the players from Tel Aviv when he was at Basel. And the second is a tweet that he wrote um, 
he didn't, I don't think he mentioned Palestine in particular or Palestinians, but he's, he, it was a general um, like condemnation of the Israeli attacks on, on Palestinians a few months ago. Um, and in both cases, I think he really had, you know, he divided the fan base uh, depending on how people already feel about those issues. Um, but, you know, the difference with the Palestine tweet is obviously he was much, much more famous than um, what he was when he was at Basel. And also uh, the expectation on him was much higher. Um, so it's it's hard to say, really. Um, I, I'm interested to see if there was a negative effect of that tweet. So you have to think, you know, who are his fans and what are their baseline opinions? If most of his fans are, you know, Arab or Muslim and they're already sympathetic to the tweet, um, and they're not critical. Some people said it didn't go far enough, for example. Uh, then maybe there's on the whole not really a, a change in people's attitudes toward Muslims. If you think, oh, 50, 60, 70 percent of his fans are not from the Middle East and are not Muslims and are also sympathetic toward Israel's actions, for example, then this could actually start damaging his reputation among those fans. But on the whole, I would say that the tweet seems to be, you know, now that we've had a few months to reflect on it, on the whole, it seems to be like a pretty minor event in the story of Salah's relationship with his fans. I would argue not shaking somebody's hand is not a minor incident, but um, um, it's just a fair play to shake a hand after a match. But yes. since he played for Basel, this might have, you know, so it would yes, have been I, I should say minor in terms of the media, media coverage. And that's also yeah. hard to predict what is the media going to cover extensively versus not. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so um, so um, uh, Mahfoud uh, Amara is asking another question. Um, interesting how Salah is integrating the debate on cultural diversity and multiculturalism in the UK for his communication with his fans in the Arab and Muslim world. And uh, he's referring to the celebration of Christmas, for example. Yeah, this was also kind of a, a social media moment for Salah is when he posts a Christmas picture. Um, he actually did get some backlash from fans saying, oh, you're a Muslim, you shouldn't be posting a picture with a Christmas tree. But I think on the whole, it, you know, in terms of the British fans or non-Muslim fans, it probably boosted his image even more, right? Because he shows that he's really making an effort and willing to integrate into British culture. Um, so except for that backlash from some Muslim fans, I'd say on the whole, it just improved, you know, the case that I made today in the study in terms of the positive uh, image that people have of him. The next question again from Paulinho Robles. Uh, that's a good, uh, interesting question. Can we say that Qatar 2022 is not only about nation branding, but also about Islam branding? Is the Islamic element of the 2022 World Cup particularly appealing to Muslims from all over the world? Um, yeah, that's a, so I, I mean, yeah, so the question is, you know, from the perspective of Muslim fans and from non-Muslim fans, what is the response to the Islamic part of Qatar's national identity? Uh, so I think for Muslim fans, it's potentially, you know, I would say probably marginally, you know, maybe not a huge driver, but it probably does have some positive effect on encouraging, you know, Muslim fans to join, to, to come to the World Cup. Um, if you have some very conservative fans who say, oh, the World Cup is kind of, a, you know, a lot of bad things happen there from a religious perspective, they might feel more comforted that it's happening in an Islamic country. At the same time, as far as I understand, there will be alcohol and other things. So I'm, I'm not sure if it will really change, you know, fans willingness to go. I mean, my sense is that, they, you know, diehard soccer fans, if they have the money, they will go, you know, and if they have the opportunity, they will go. And a factor like that is maybe marginally positive, but not a not a deal breaker. Um, I think from from a non-Muslim perspective, it's going to show another side to Islam, you know, maybe negative, maybe positive, but it's a different data point for people to have. It's some exposure where most of people's exposure to the Muslim world is pretty negative. Um, so uh, I hope that there are there's at least something that Qatar can offer on behalf of the Muslim world that is positive. But to do that, I think they probably need to like address some of these criticisms um, head on and really get to the root cause of why people have this negative impression. Some part of it might just be you know, old fashioned racism and Islamophobia, I'm sure of that. Um, but some other parts, I think it's within Qatar's control to actually respond to some of those criticisms. Mm -hmm. Um, 
Paola Castro uh, is writing a World Cup will always be a fun event and Qatar is doing everything to continue that path. However, do you think there's something else that can be done from the Qatari Society, Supreme Committee, um, etc., to start showing what the country represents? Yeah. Um... That's an interesting question. So, I mean, I think you need to understand first the root causes of the negative perception. So if the negative perception is tied to these like reports of, you know, bribery and human rights abuses, that has to be addressed. You know, people need to actually think that something has been done from a policy perspective to address those points. Um, at the same time, like if uh, at the same time, it can only be a positive thing in terms of, you know, Qatari government aside, there are people who live in Qatar and very different kinds of people and they're humans and they're complex. And the more that we can make connections with just the average residents of Qatar, um, I think that can only be a good thing for people having more of a nuanced image of what Muslims are like or what people who live in the Middle East are like. Mm. Uh, Vishal Kashaib, I hope I pronounced the name wrong. If not, I apologize. In a nutshell, what, what do you think is the key takeaway from the data crunch? In a nutshell, if you have a minority player who everyone knows is from a stigmatized minority and who plays almost perfectly, uh, you can reasonably expect that they're going to reduce prejudice toward the entire group that they belong to. And then there is a question on the player, uh, Frederick Canute uh, in Sevilla. Uh, playing in Sevilla 2005-2010, he showed the same attitude as Salah on the feed, but didn't have the same exposure. Do you think uh, social media transformation was a factor on this? Yeah, so I'm not I'm not familiar with this particular player, but um, I think the the media coverage is such a big thing, not only in people's actual exposure to the celebrity but also in whether that exposure is positive or negative. The media has a really big role to play in that. And it's very hard to predict when the media will decide to cover something and whether they will decide to cover it positively or negatively. Um, and Salah, you know, because he's basically perfect on the field, you don't, the media basically has no reason to cover him negatively, but that could change if he starts to have a bad season or he starts to become more political. Um, so I'd say, you know, media coverage needs to be high and needs to be positive to see these kinds of effects. And it's hard to know when that will be the case. Mm -hmm. So I, I think I read all questions. There's still some in the chat, but I think um, I read them. Um, and um, so, Saima, what can we expect from, from you in the future? Are you planning? Um, more uh, soccer related uh, research um, on other celebrities or uh, <laughs> is there anything in the making? Yeah, so I mean, our next big project is, um, I alluded to this earlier, is really looking at the importance of success in these kinds of effects. Mm -hmm. So do you need to play as well as Salah to have these effects? And the opposite, if you have a bad day, is there actually a backlash against minority players as opposed to white players in the Premier League? Um, so that's something we're looking at this season. So hopefully we'll finish the data collection this season and try to look at these incidents that happen when a player plays badly or plays badly relative to the predicted um, performance that they should have had. And then look at the reaction among fans and in the public. And is there more of a backlash to having a bad day for minority players? Um, so hopefully, hopefully that's coming up. Uh, well, why I looked in the future, there is another question just came in. Have you analyzed media coverage and or fan tweets about players celebrating Ramadan? Yeah, that's that's an interesting one, because um, on the one hand, it increases people, it increases non-Muslim fans awareness of Muslim culture, um, which is, you know, a good thing. It's humanizing uh, Muslim players. But on the other hand, uh, some fans are not happy about players observing observing Ramadan from a purely selfish standpoint, right? They don't want the um, performance to be impacted negatively. I think it was Jose Mourinho who also had uh, a player a few years back who was observing Ramadan and, and he was very upset about it. And he made some comments to the press saying this guy shouldn't have been fasting. 
Um, you also have on uh, fantasy, so fantasy Premier League, uh, you have fans who are always discussing this question saying, oh, this player is going to be benched because he's fasting or he has to come off at this minute because this is when the fast breaking time is. So he's not going to play like the 60 minutes required in order for us to get two points if we play him. Uh, so I see it more from that, you know, fans are, are mainly interested in how it affects the player's performance. Um, but I think, you know, there's the other side of it where it's also providing more information about Islam. So um, especially if the, if the player's performance doesn't doesn't seem to suffer, I think it, it could be positive, but it, it really depends on what the performance looks like, because if it's a bad day, it's another very easy uh, excuse for people to go to and say, oh, look, you know, Muslims again, you know, not integrating and uh, in for, you know, doing their own thing at the cost of the fans, for example. Um, so it really depends how the what the relationship is or perceived relationship between fasting and playing. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Um, there is another question by. Uh, uh, Ronnie Blaschke, how could Western football clubs and federations connect to Muslim communities um, in their cities? Yeah, that's a good question. So, I mean, I think this is really uh, country specific. So like in Sweden, it's a country I'm uh, familiar, very familiar with. You have clubs in the domestic leagues that are you know, immigrant clubs, which are, you know, the Assyrian club. And that's a club largely composed of Iraqi Assyrian uh, refugees or immigrants, for example. So you have this kind of segregation where people are mainly meeting each other as competitors, um, which is, you know, that is one thing that we find is like pretty negative. Like if you're not playing on the same team, if you're competing, then that's not the right type of contact. Um, so I'd say that um, the more that we can, the more that there's this outreach in different, you know, immigrant neighborhoods and suburbs where we can have some mixing. Um, I'm not saying we should, you know, avoid immigrants creating their own clubs. I think that's obviously that's important uh, as well. But the more that we can have mixed clubs as being this node in society where mixing can happen on something that's completely non-political and based on a shared interest, um, just anecdotally speaking, I mean, I think this is a really powerful thing. And for a lot of people, it might be the only experience they have to actually make a friend from someone from another group. Um, so I'd say to try to build those bridges between groups on the same team, not in a competitive environment where everyone creates their, you know, si creates their own team and then signs up. Because once that yeah. has already happened, you're unlikely to get the kind of positive contact you need. Yeah, I concur. My colleague, uh, Karen Walter, is asking, what are the wider societal implications in a democracy that in order to be an accepted Muslim, uh, one has to be quiet politically? In what ways does this confirm with the model minority myth? Uh, great question. <laughs> um, so, I mean, this is, this is one thing we talk about in the paper too. How important is it that he doesn't take any political stances? He, he's so non-controversial. Um, in a way that, you know, someone could criticize him for saying you actually have a platform to draw attention to some issues related to Muslim uh, suffering around the world. So, for example, Mesut Ozil, who's a or was a player for Arsenal, um, got a lot of backlash from his own club included when he started talking about the abuses of Uyghur Muslims in China, for example. Um, so I don't think we're saying we're not proposing that players stay quiet. I think what we're saying is we need to gather more, we need more studies basically that look at what is the effect of a player becoming an activist and taking a political stance. A, it could alienate some parts of the, of the fan base. If your goal is prejudice reduction, that could be bad. bad. But on the other hand, it could actually show uh, people what it's like to be a minority living through these struggles and give them a window into that experience that they might not have otherwise had that actually encourages empathy toward minorities um, in a way that would uh, reduce prejudice. And so you have two like counter, countervailing effects and we don't really know like what would be the average effect of a player taking this kind of political stance. And I mean, I think that's like, that is the study that needs to be done next. Activism, of course, can always uh, also have different forms. I mean, Uzi, for example, was advertising the re-election of, of Erdogan which made him a controversial uh, figure in Germany. And then, of course, once he became a controversial figure, 
he was also um, uh, racially uh, incited on social media, etc. Um, so uh, Mahfoud Amara is uh, writing, it may be interesting to compare the case with the French League and the debate about Islam and sport in secular France. And another comment is uh, confirming what you wrote, what you said on, on Mo Salah posted on Instagram several times, celebrating Christmas with his family with a Christmas tree in his house. Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, I think this um, France is such an interesting case for so many reasons for sport. Um, you had Eric Cantona saying, oh, when we win, it's like this multicolored, you know, country and we're so progressive. And when we lose, all of a sudden we're Blacks, Arabs, immigrants. Um, and so I think you see a lot of these tensions really crystallized in France in a lot of ways. Um, there's also like the whole secular state aspect of it. So um, I think it was in soccer, but it was maybe a, an, another Olympic team I'm thinking about. But I remember a few years back that some national team wanted halal meals to be provided for the players and then the request was denied or it was some controversial thing because you can't put state funds toward a religious request. Um, so these debates at the kind of administrative level and then at the social level are always there. And, and France also has this other layer where um, there's this hesitation to talk about race in France, like in, a, in the US, it's the other extreme, you know, we, we have um, the racial lens is very salient, whereas in France, it's really downplayed. And so I think people don't always have the vocabulary to even to even talk about these things as they do in other parts of the world. Um, but yeah, I mean, we initially when we thought of this project, we wanted to look at uh, data from France around the 98 World Cup win, like before and after the win uh, and then compare France with other European countries on these survey questions that ask about um, Muslims and attitudes toward Muslim immigrants. Um, but we weren't lucky. There was no survey that was happening around that time that we could take advantage of. But um, I think that's certainly something that we can now do you know, in a forward looking way, knowing that the World Cup in Qatar is coming up. I think uh, the next question is not to uh, Salma Musa as a professor, it's to Salma Musa as a football fan. Do you think Salah is the best player in the world? I mean, I think he is he's up there. He is on top. He's one of the best, if not the best. I think that's clear. And it's just been amazing to see to see his rise and to really keep that position. I mean, we were when we wrote this paper, someone asked how long did the paper take? You know, we, we finished this paper before just before they won the domestic title. And we thought, you know, what if he is a one season wonder, you know, and in our survey experiment, we actually had a treatment condition initially where we told people he was kind of a failure, like he's a one season wonder. Some people say he's slipping in form um, and that treatment had no effect because people didn't believe it. <laughs> And, you know, lo and behold, three, he's not really a three, you can't be a three season wonder, you know, so he's definitely on the road to becoming a legend at the club, um, if he keeps up at this rate, and I, I hope that's what we get to see. And an interesting aspect, since you are uh, Egyptian, um, is that there is a large Egyptian uh, um, diaspora, a large Egyptian community in, in, in Qatar, it's around 300,000 people. I went this year to the Club World Cup, uh, Bayern Munich playing against Al Ali, and uh, the atmosphere in the stadium was fantastic with, with all the Egyptian fans. It was already amazing and when going by Metro to the stadium. So I, I hope Egypt will be qualifying for the World Cup because I think for, for, for the atmosphere of the event, it would be fantastic. Also, I don't know how hopeful you are for Egypt to. <laughs> advance in the tournament oh, I don't know. Not have that many players which are that good as uh, Mohamed Salah I was I actually I was very lucky to go to the World Cup in Russia and I got to see Egypt play Russia there and I regretted that Egypt ever made it into the World Cup um like first it was like you know, it was my dream and then I just I couldn't believe that we ended up not winning a single game I mean especially there was a game against Saudi Arabia at the end that I just thought this team is just you know there were a lot of issues going on in the Egyptian camp but I, I really hope that if they do get in this year that they um, you know, are a bit more organized and have a bit more support from the Egyptian Federation to perform as, as well as they can. Um, and well, I'm maybe, as an Elif fan, by the way, so, you know, no comments Egypt, on the game. Maybe Egypt choose the wrong state to practice during the World Cup in the, yeah. I mean, this was a highly political 
issue. Yeah, I mean, there is a lot going on. Yeah. Uh, Saima, I mean, uh, as somebody is, is just writing in the chat that was a marathon of answering uh, questions, and maybe we, we come soon to, to an end, uh, but I think there's a great uh, last question from uh, Emmanuel Nana, who is asking, how has your experience um, of uh, being here at GUQ uh, helped you to, to build up your research and, and to become who you are now? Well, that's quite a question. Um, I mean, just on a on a very practical level, I mean, it gave me an education that was the, you know, a world class education um, with so many resources. I mean, I was just talking earlier to the Dean and to Daniel. I mean, we had books and laptops and trips around the world. And like you just we were so, so fortunate um, to have those resources that we had. Um, and at the same time, to still be able to have my education in the Middle East, be close to my family, that was really important. I was really young when I started. And so just have, being close to my family was important. And so this was probably the best education I could get within the radius that I was interested in. And it turned out to be world class. So that was lucky for me. Um, and I guess in terms of the training, too, I mean, you get this. I mean, it's just I mean, I, I did the international politics major. Um, and back then we also had the quantitative methods courses, which I really hope are expanded because that really got my mind thinking in those terms, like starting to look at the world from, um, from a statistical framework, you know, like for, from probability theory, from like how likely are these events from hypothesis testing and hypothesis testing is really like, that's the core of research. Um, and so that was the first class that I took at Georgetown. And so uh, I really hope that that tradition continues and expands. And I can tell you that without that, those statistics, statistics classes, I, you know, which I built on later at Stanford, I would absolutely not be where I am today. Yeah, uh, certainly when looking at your research, you like quantitative uh, methods, and I'm sure you did very well in that class. Uh, Saima, that was terrific. I tremendously enjoyed um, your lecture and the conversation with you. That was fantastic. And I wish you all the best for your future work and personally. And I pass on to Dean Wilcox for some concluding remarks. Well, I'm an American, so I'm not quite as familiar with the great football players as uh, Salma, but this has been a fascinating uh, conversation. I've really enjoyed it. Uh, I'm really proud to have a Georgetown graduate uh, do this well. I uh, thank you, Daniel, for hosting. Thank you all for your good questions um, and have a good evening. Thank you. And a special thanks to Daniel for, the, for moderating and to really spark a great discussion. Um, great. Thank you all for having me and please stay in touch. <laughs>